Hey everybody, welcome to another week. I am your host of Lionheart Radio, of course, Rick Alexander. Today's show is a little bit different than Lionheart Radio, though. Today we have the Lionheart Radio sideshow, and for those of you that have been listening to Lionheart Radio for a while, know that we've had George Brionis of Softleet on the show multiple times, a couple times now, and I've been on his show, and a lot of times we're bouncing ideas back and forth from training to each other and, and talking about different things. And this idea came up that maybe we should have a show where just him and I kind of talk about training and we talk about life and we talk about life as it pertains to training. And as we started doing it, we realized we we had something here and we wanted to make it live. Um, And so this isn't on the Lionheart Radio website, but it is on the Lionheart Radio channel. So you can listen to this show weekly by checking out the Lionheart Radio channel and subscribing on iTunes. And if you're not into it, no big deal. Just skip over all of the ones that say the Lionheart Radio Sideshow. They will have their own numbering system. uh, And we'll continue on this week with episode 107 of Lionheart Radio. And none of those will change. In today's show, we talk about coaching. We talk about partying. We talk about the proper role of ambition. We talk about entrepreneurship. We even get into suicide and some heavier topics. I really enjoyed this show, and I'm looking forward to it. If you guys like it, if you could just let me let me know, let George know. Um, you know, feedback is always good, so that we can make sure that we are on the right track, delivering you reliable content and value. Without further ado, onto the Lionheart Radio sideshow. <laughs> I'm train of thought. I'm just going with that. <laughs> well, let's do that. Let's uh, let's kick this show off and let's start talking about continuing edge for athletes yeah. and coaches. So she uh, she actually was talking a lot about um, like she does a lot of DNS, so dynamic neuro like neurological um, like stretching and movement work. So the whole like PRI type thing she's like done. I mean, and like continuous education continues coming out. It goes back to the same topic we had last week when we were talking about the whole. CrossFit um, coach, do they have to be a regional level athlete to make it into, to make athletes that good to get there? And, you know, we both had our difference, differences on it, but it was funny that it was because like CrossFit coaches are just one domain, know how to do one thing. But then you have coaches like ourselves who are full on, like understand the strength and the conditioning energy systems and so forth. And we can program for different types of athletes and bring our own flair into things so when it does come to you know coaching we don't are not just this one trick pony right yeah well it's really interesting because if you look at the entire health and fitness world right like right now i'm in north carolina because i'm doing all my continuing education shit for my paramedic because it's like the entire health and fitness world requires so much requalification and continuing education credits per year and paramedics probably the lowest, but nursing, uh, you know, doctors, they all, they all have so much that they have to do. My buddy's a PA, and it's like he said, like the first thing he realized when he became a PA is that his entire life is becoming learning. Like he, yeah. he, it's never, you're never done with school. And what's interesting, though, a lot of people get their personal training cert or their CrossFit level one or whatever. And then it seems like that doesn't. It doesn't seem to have that much of an emphasis in strength and conditioning, like continuing education, unless you're like someone that, like you that's really hungry for it. Well, and that's the thing, though, is like a lot of people just get it. So one, they say they have it. Two, that someone's going to open a gym, right? Usually is what we see it as. Someone's like, oh, I got my level one. Now I can go to a gym, be a trainer there, or train there and be a trainer. So it kind of one of those things compared to some of the coaches who look at, hey, can I turn this into a lifestyle and a profession? And like, I think nowadays with where the, like where just strength conditioning is going, like, can it be a profession? Yes, it can be. And people have shown it to be, you really have to work towards it. And if you like, you just can't go start taking on these seminars and taking these certifications and continuing education. That's great. But if you don't know how to apply what you're being taught or develop your own principles and your own methods and your own practices for things, you're not going to go ahead and and get anywhere in, in this realm of of strength conditioning, fitness, and health and wellness as a whole. Yeah. Yeah, no, I completely agree. What's interesting is if I look back at all of the really good coaches that I've had, it's almost an art form. Like good can, good programming like really comes down to an art form in my opinion. Like anybody, for example, I can give you a workout right now that will just crush your dick, right? Like yep. we could do – uh, thrusters into wall balls into some other below parallel shoulder movement, right? And it's like that's not really hard. It's not hard to make someone really tired. What is really hard is uh, 
programming it in a way so that it kind of like I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this. It's like if you look at Fran, like that's an artfully programmed workout. Even though everybody hates it and it sucks, the way that it taxes your energy systems, the way that it it uses a push movement into a pull movement, like it's it's programmed in a way that you can go really hard from one movement to the other and it sucks really bad, but that's different than going from let's say thrusters to wall balls where it sucks really bad, but also you just hit muscle fatigue, right? It's like, it's an art where it gets programmed, so it's so hard, but still doable. Yeah, I don't know if I'm describing it right, but... No, no, you're, you're describing it right, and the way I look at it as, is like, as a whole, right, is like when we're developing a program as a whole, it's, it's, you have an internal structure and you have an external structure of the program, and it's one of those things where when you kind of look at the two, and people can develop their own idea of what an internal structure and an external structure of the program can be, but when I look at the internal structure of the program, I look at what's happening with the progressions of ie your strength portion right like okay we're in a hypertrophy block all right cool we're going to go ahead and work this set of this reps for this week and then next week we're going to go ahead and adjust those reps and sets to to manage fatigue so that we can see the proper stimulus of the athlete and then when we look at external you know structure we look at the the external you know stressors that are being put onto the athlete from outside of the gym as a whole. So you have to know how to control the internal structure of the program as a whole to make sure that we're reaching the proper, you know, recovery and adaptations for the athlete so we can continue progressing and and practicing and reaching towards that athlete's goals. And I'm going to go back to the same thing where you said it's an art form. And it's one thing that I actually really emphasize a lot whenever I talk about programming. I mean, I think it comes from I think it comes from my past and being an artist. I used to do a lot of painting. I used to do a lot of coloring. I used to tattoo a little bit of my time frame. All my homies in the Marine Corps knew that I tattooed a few people back in the day. Did you? I'm sorry about that. Oh, dude, it was so bad. Um, But I used to draw, and I used to enjoy drawing, and I painted really well. I have family that's very artistic. So the kind of way I explain when I look at programming is, right, it's like every color that you have, you know, every paintbrush that you have and whatever canvas you're developing, we're looking at this end goal of it. But with every color we pick and every color we blend and every stroke of that brush that we put into this into this art, we're developing this masterpiece that we created that had no goal, no objective to all of a sudden we, we visualize what we need to see and we develop this goal that we actually started visualizing just through the work of our hand and the same way we look at programming right when i can look at programming now it's like all right i have this white spreadsheet or i have my paper and from here now i got to go ahead and put movements that are going to go ahead and correlate to the athlete's goals and weaknesses and then we have to put rep sets in there and everything else like that it's just like painting by the time i'm done with that you know four week block eight week block and then that 12 week block you know, all the way through, I have this masterpiece that has multiple internal structures into it that's going to go ahead and let me follow along the weeks with my athletes and I can control the internal stressors that are happening from this program with pairing it with the external structure or stressors that are happening to manage those two. And I think a lot of coaches miss that point. They miss what point? Where the, they, they don't use the internal programming in order to account for what this external stress that athletes it, are under. Exactly. Or even vice versa, right? They have no – or they don't even understand the differences between internal and external structure or, or the stressors of what's going on from their programming and what's going on outside of the programming where an athlete lives 20 hours outside of the gym, right? Your higher-level athletes are training twenty out, uh, four hours a day probably split those in two sessions we got people like ourselves where we go out and run for an hour and a half to two hours and everything else is based around training right and i'm going to use an example dude uh jim's wamsley who's one of the top ultra runners right now uh in the united states he's getting ready to go run western states next week and he did a podcast with uh, nz elite the hoka podcast or whatever else they have out okay and he uh he actually said this really cool he was like you know one thing that i've learned with that's different from ultra running and all the other sports that i've competed in was that even though I'm looking at running and my programming as an internal structure, and he didn't say internal structure, but this is how I conveyed it. He's like, it automatically makes all my other things around me that much better, right? And he's like, man, he's like, I'm able to now focus on how I'm sleeping, focus on how I'm eating, focus on, you know, just prioritizing my life as a whole, um, which was really, really cool for him to say that because I made a post a couple of days ago talking about how 
running an ultra has actually helped me become better at just life in general to manage things and, and actually compartmentalize it and have a priority. So it's one of those things where I go back to this whole internal and external structure of a program and how a coach should see it is being able to understand that the, the program should convey with the lifestyle of that athlete at the end of the day. Again, that's my opinion, right? And like what I've been taught and what I learned and what I see now from from experiences. Um, but it, that's kind of the simplest way I can kind of explain that as a whole when we look at being an artist who paints and puts out these these masterpiece, right? Yeah. Um, it's just kind of what it is. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a genius analogy, actually, a great way to look at it. What, what I'm wondering, and I, I think this is something that you've been really good at, is like figuring out different ways to speak to these external stressors in the programming. Um, I've definitely had coaches in the past. I, I'm, I won't throw anybody under the bus, but I remember I was training a lot for CrossFit, and I remember talking to him, and I'm like, I had this going on at work, and you know, we were doing a lot of stuff carrying the boats and running and shit like that. And I remember talking to him and I'm like, dude, my shoulders are just fucking crushed every day. And, I, and he had me doing a ton of shoulder stability work and whatever. I remember talking to him and he's like, well, man, you know, based on where you want to get, you just got to do the work. And I was like, okay, man. So I just went in there and I blew out both shoulders. And like, it's that's not on him. That's on me. But it's just this idea of like, um, I wish I had just spoke for that. Like, dude, you're doing so much shoulders at work. Like you don't need to do it. But you know, and, and it's a communication thing, but I'm wondering, like, how do you go about starting to do that for an athlete? Well, that's that's funny you asked that, too, man, is because I just had a conversation with a couple of buddies. Of mine. I'm not going to say their name just to keep it um, just whatever else. We had a conversation about that. There's some really good coaches who program for remote athletes all the time. And, you know, it was the question was he was super pissed about having an athlete who just wanted pure volume, but who was in chronic pain. And I deal with that a lot of times. It's funny is like I, I, I always say is like I don't get high level athletes. I get athletes who are kind of like in pain who need life style changes. And I kind of help them with that. And then from there, if they understand the process, we can go further with it. But that was a question we had, dude, was that was that right there and then was like, OK, cool. At what point does a coach now either choose to be like, OK, am I going to just give them the volume that they want? because of the fact because they're an athlete and that's their goals and I'm their coach or is at that time and moment where okay cool I'm gonna fire this athlete because they don't understand my process and there's no trust here so why should I continue putting time and effort into it if there is no trust right so it's like if the coach is like okay I'm gonna go and give you all the volume like is that wrong of the coach or is it because they're doing it for a financial backing right right and they don't really care for the well-being of that athlete and at the end of the day it comes down to what that coach's goals are right like is this just a money maker for me or is this something that's going to provide some kind of value for me at the end of the day so I'm continue making people better because that's what I want to do. And I feel like there's two different types of coaches. We have those kind of coaches that you mentioned, you know, where I'm just going to give you pure volume to where, you know, we got coaches like myself and, and, and people that I know who will go ahead and be like, look, if you're not going to follow along with what we're doing and, and trust in this plan and it's my job to convey and continue to the buy in at all times. Um, then maybe it's maybe it's good for you to go to someone else and you, we're just not a best fit. Yeah. And I think there's a problem with that. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, some of the problem is I I did buy in. I was like, okay, well, this guy's produced a bunch of games athletes, so fucking I'm going to do what he says, you know? Um, and so that it's a difficult relationship to try to manage. I mean, like there's just so many moving parts. Like you're not – and that's an interesting thing too, you know, like if you look back, personal trainers like you go to like Bally's in 24 hours and these bullshit fitness places it's like people pay 30 bucks an hour and they get this personal trainer and they get them for that hour and then maybe they don't have enough money so they don't go back you know for a while but it's like when we talk about like what you're doing or a little bit of what I'm doing it's like you're you're like owning these people are giving you something that is like super precious which is their fucking vitality right like this is their yeah. life force and you have a chance to either do something really awesome with that or really shitty and that's something i think a lot of coaches kind of miss the mark on they don't take like the necessarily take the responsibility for what they're doing to their athletes cuz it's like you have the option to make this person's life like really great if you can account for these external stressors and you can uh, you can make programming something that doesn't crush them throughout, you know, something that they don't do and then they're fucked for the rest of the day because it was so hard. And, you know, those are all the different things that it seems like don't get talked about that much in coaching these days. No, and it's not, dude. It's funny you say that because, again, like we're not saying that it's all about the programming for the athlete to make it to that level, right? Like you have to talk about genetics. You have to talk about that lifestyle of the athlete, what they're doing and their sure. willpower. It's it's a whole it's a whole spectrum. 
but you only have 2% of that is what I like to say. You only have 2% of everything else. And like, if you're only going to give them 1% and they're not, and you know that you have another percent to give, then why aren't you, then you're doing a disservice to that athlete. So it's one of those things is like, all right, cool. Like I have to understand and know, right. These are like, well, coaches too. Like there's really good coaches out there. We see them all over the place that understand this where they're like, okay, cool. I need to know how the athlete's sleeping. I need to know how the athlete's eating. I need to know what the athlete's relationship's like at home. What is, if it's a female athlete, like what's their menstrual cycle? You know, all these kinds of things. If it's a male athlete, like knowing like when they're trying to push and when they're not, all those kinds of things. The same thing though, it's not about coaching the athlete. It's now about educating the athlete of how to live a healthier lifestyle, not just in the gym, but outside of it. So for instance, if I was to walk away from the athlete, the athlete was like, hey, I'm good you know that you gave them something, you just give them a piece, right? You give them, you help them become 1% better, yeah. right? Of that 2% you were giving them because that's what they took from being with you however minutes long or whatever else, but you gave them and you educate them because at the end of the day, that's where we're now. We are educators. We're, I'm, especially like for myself, I'm an educator. Like I just want to educate my athletes to make sure that they understand what's going on. Yeah, before this, when I was a buds instructor, you know, like I would get these students because I was at Indoc, so I like, we got 200 students every eight weeks and you know, most of them are not going to, 75% of them are not going to make it. And I remember this guy, uh, one of the mentors I had, I talked to him and I was like, I was kind of down because I'm like, you know, how do you put all of you into this kid that you know, like probably isn't going to make it anyway. And he's like, yeah, but you're like missing the point, man. Like, are you trying to make like really good operators or should these people leave and just be really just be great humans because they interacted with you. And that's like kind of a mentality that I've tried to take to coaching. I've tried to take to everything. It's like this relationship's not going to go, it might not go any kind of distance and it might, but either way, uh, and if everybody that leaves your presence should leave being a better human than when they started. And I think if yeah. you just shoot for that, like both parties are always going to leave better. Yeah. Especially, or you're going to continue moving forward with the athlete in the realm of, of being able to do that. Yeah. Right. Of giving them what their goals are. Right. And, and, you know, one of the things we talked about last week, which I think you and I have done more podcasts that are never going to be, <laughs> that are never going to get published. Like, I, I really think we've done like five that are never going to get published. We've done five, bro. That... <laughs> but one of the things we talked about before we, I fucked up the audio content on the quality on the last one was this idea of like having really high level clients. Like, that's what one of the things you talked about. Like, you like having high level clients because you put so much into their success. Um, and it, it's like, how do you, it's a hard thing to differentiate. Well, that's the funny thing too, though, is like, I might like, it's a different enjoyment and a different, uh, a different stimulus for me with working with a high level athlete and working with a newer athlete, right? Like being able to see the small things like that, that like 0.1% in the higher athlete of their skill and of their movement and of their power output and their aerobic system and just getting better in that realm is really, really gratifying due to the fact of it takes longer for those athletes now to develop all those skills across the board. But when we look at the lower skill athletes who are new, I love enjoying working with them also due to the fact that we see these huge, these huge beginner games that people talk about, right? But you now as the coach who are programming for them, you can control this, this spike from being not good to being a semi-decent athlete. But unfortunately, what happens, a lot of athletes that come into the CrossFit realm or come into sports in general, they go from zero to this decent athlete right away. But then it takes them now four or five years to go ahead and get to that next level due to the facts of how fast they got somewhere because they probably missed a lot of things going up to that realm. And then all of a sudden now they have to backtrack and work on all the things they missed compared to a coach who knows that and now can throw into this realm of a – pretty much a rolling, like a rolling hill is what I like to call it, right? Just a rolling hill of progress. So you hit high skill and you come down, or not high school, but you hit a, an achievement and you come down a little bit. You hit another achievement and you come down to where this is going across a linear progression to where you see the athletes, you know, their progress never really stops compared to someone who is new, who just goes straight for it because they just wanted to just, instead of practicing the things they needed to practice. Yeah, you know, I think, I was thinking about this yesterday randomly enough, but I think the people that are doing the best in, I think the people that you that get the biggest gains in life, like the people that really seem to move from bottom left to top right in the graph, like it's just the long term. Like if you were to like kind of 
bring the scale down on that graph and you were to look at their progress, like it would be so chaotic and up and down and up and down. But it's like, I, I, I was thinking about that the other day. It's like, well, how do I ensure that I'm always moving toward that top right, even when I'm having, you know, even when you're having bad days, even when you're, you're going through times like I was just sick for a complete week, like I was, yeah. we were just talking about, I couldn't train at all. I couldn't even do like normal life shit, let alone go for a run or a lift. It's like, how do I ensure that I'm always going toward that top right? You know what I mean? And, and that's where it comes down to where, you know, we talked about entire the internal structure and the external structure of understanding of like the athlete and everything else around it and ourselves too, right? Like, and let's be real here. Like you literally went out for a weekend and partied all three days really, really hard. Whoa. And then. Why are you coming at me like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, because let's, let's, we're being real here, right? Like, let's be real here, right? Like if I was to go out and party for three days hard and come back the next day and throw a 15 mile run in like someone did, right? <laughs> And all of a sudden, I'm probably going to go ahead and be down in the count for how long? Yeah. No, I did it to myself. I ran my – well, it was the perfect storm. I think I got sick right as I ran my immune system into the ground. Exactly. But the thing is, though, is like no one else controlled that but you. And like at the end of the day, as educators, we have to educate them and being like, look, I've been here and done that. If you're going to go in and party all weekend, well, guess what your next week's going to be like? You right. know what I'm <laughs> Dude, I've never regretted anything more. This whole fucking <laughs> week when I couldn't train, I couldn't do anything. Like I, I had to cancel all my podcasts for the week. Like it was total useless. I was just like, I can't tell you how much I fucking regret doing that. You know, like it's cool to go like it's cool to live that. I'm not telling no one not to go out and rage for three or four days, like, but like be smart about it on the back end, right? Or just like if you're gonna go push that hard, be smart on the back end. Um, which, for instance, like, you know, I'm gonna, I'll use myself for existence. And uh, for example, I'm, I'm not fucking perfect, guys, so nowhere near it. And I had a, a 13 mile run with 55K invert on Sunday. It was six and a half hours out. And then the next day, I had a, uh, I ended up doing a 10 mile run with 15 to 1600 feet elevation gain. Nothing crazy. Um, and then Tuesday, I came out and I was supposed to do a tempo 12 mile run. No juice. I, it was probably one of the hardest things I've done. And then yesterday I had only five miles. But the thing is, though, is like what I ended up doing, I noticed how much I was going to be doing the next four days. I was literally asleep by 930 every single night. And I think I ate every single like thing I saw mm -hmm. and just focused on recovery and mobility because I'll tell you what, in the past couple of weeks or like five, six weeks ago when I would do that. I wasn't, I was just trying to push super hard and I dug myself into the hole where I got food poisoning and I got a bad fever and everything else like that. And I was messed up. But again, though, it's learning from our own experiences, right? So like for you to learn that, like, you know better, but you're like, I'm having fun, like whatever. Like who cares if we use ourselves ex as examples, but that's what it is, right? Right, right. <laughs> so sorry for throwing you on the bus, homie, but I just had to use that as an example <laughs> because it was a perfect time and perfect example that right there and then and being like, bro, like that's an example of an ex like you control that like yeah but it, again like I said and and I think a lot of people like are just thinking that everyone's Superman and realistically no one's not <laughs> right yeah I mean you know what happened is dude I got I went to regionals for three days and I didn't do one fitness activity while at regionals I just drank with this like whole house of people for three days and I got home and I I know how badly I get hung over so I was like not this time life. And so I fucking went for a 15 mile run the next morning when I woke up and then I went to work. I started getting tired again at the end of work. So I went to the gym and I did a CrossFit workout and like, you know, I have no resources in the tank right now. Like I've got <laughs> nothing to go on. I'm just like pure fuck you. I'm doing it. And I woke up the next day and it was over. Dude. I got so sick and I will not do it again. <laughs> but it's it's funny though. It's like everyone and, and again, right? And it's funny. Is like I don't know if anybody knows. It's like I'm going to school right now for going back to school for taking my bachelor's in sports psychology. And the class I'm taking right now is critical thinking. And we have to do a presentation on perception is reality. And right there and then, right? Like everyone sees social media and like what we do for a living. And like like everyone sees a perception of us like living a happy health healthy life. And like we don't party and we don't drink and we don't do drugs and we don't do any of that stuff and we don't go to Mexico and have fun. Like, <laughs> right. like, but the reality is like all those things have happened in our life period. And like, we still make mistakes just like everyone else does. And no one's that no one's, no one's perfect. Right. And we talk about the vulnerability of, of doing that. Like that's all it is. Right. For people to be like, Oh shit. Like, yeah, that's okay. Cool. Like, hell yeah. Rick had a good time this weekend. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, Bonnie Schroeder, the power lifter, she like 
saw one of my pictures and just wrote like living your best life for sure. I was like, yeah, well. <laughs> but the thing is, though, is it was like, but that's perception, right? Everyone sees something, but the reality is that. Yeah. So it's it's really cool to be able to like kind of pinpoint that, dude, and like you bring that up like that, and we talk about that for people. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's something I actually. This is a good thing to talk about because I. It's something I struggle with a little bit, and I think a lot of people do. It's like. There's so much of me that is like just consumed with wanting to find my ultimate peak of human performance. Like I want to die after – like I do not want to die without knowing everything that my body's capable of, right? And then there comes a point where you do that for months and months and months and you're like, I kind of want to go down to Mexico and get fucked up for the week, you know? And it's like – it's kind of weird. It's like a hard, how do you balance that? It's like especially in someone in the fitness industry. Like I mean you know, I don't think a lot of people talk about this because it's – like probably not that popular to talk about. Like I don't, I don't really know. People have like stigmas around partying, around whatever. But I'm like, it's a hard thing to actually integrate in your life because they really do run counter to each other. Like partying in no way. And I'm not talking about drugs. Like there, there's ways to like plant medicines. That's a whole different thing. But when you talk about like partying, it really runs counter to performance in every facet. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's funny though. It's like when we can go ahead and use, um, I'm going to use CrossFit again, right? We keep using CrossFit because that's one of those things where everyone goes so hard, but then they party really hard. Yeah, also. it's it's built into the lifestyle in CrossFit. It's, it's and we talk about that, right? It's like okay, cool, but they're but again, they do those those stints where they train for the open, for instance, right? All right, it's January. I'm not going to party until after the open. I'm going to go as hard as I can for the next three and a half, four months, and then once that last over, open workout's over, I'm going to go. Especially for those who don't like go re, go to regionals, but like their life is the open, so like that's what it is. They don't drink, they don't do anything, they sleep, they eat properly, and all of a sudden now that weekend of the open's over, and guess what happens? Oh, I know, I was partying with them on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> right, like like that's one of those things, right? And you also see it in the endurance realm. We do see it there also, right? Like, hey, I'm gonna go super hard for the next three months because I have a, a race coming up. All right, cool. After that race, now then it's game over. We even see it with food. Like, we don't want to talk about like alcohol and you know all the good stuff but we and I, well, let's talk about food though in general mm -hmm. how many people go on a diet for three to four months for a certain goal of theirs and then once that goal is accomplished and completed how hard do they go next oh it's like the <laughs> thing right like get a summer body then wreck it all summer long exactly right so yeah. it's just one of those things where it's like is it counterintuitive yes but are we human yes do we live in a in you know a society where that is enjoyable and that is acceptable and that is fun and that is how people get out and socialize yeah yeah, and, and to be clear, that's like my one time this year. You just happen to call it out in front of a whole bunch of people. But like, you know, I'm <laughs> I'm somebody. So I figured it was. I figured people could notice. Right. Well, I'm somebody that like it, I'm not good at drinking. Like as far as like you know, I've got friends that really don't get hungover, and so even though yeah, it still affects their performance. They don't like notice it as much. Like for me, I actually get hungover. So you know, for really long periods, like I'm getting ready to announce a huge run that I'm going to do at the end of the summer. Like all summer long, I'm gonna have to like lock it down because I, I can't afford to miss a week of training like yeah. I just did. Like that's how bad drinking gets me. And so, um, like yeah, I think on some level you just gotta kind of know yourself and like how it affects you, and then how does that tie into the overall masterpiece that you're trying to paint, right? Yeah, and exactly right. And like you know, you see people who you know I know a lot of endurance athletes who pound beer every single night and are just phenomenal athletes, or who consume bunch of marijuana and THC and edibles that are doing amazing things right like sure it's not about that it's about it's about the idea of like all right cool like is this something that's part of your diet all the time or you're part of your lifestyle all the time or is it more of like all right I'm gonna cut out of my lifestyle for three months and then all of a sudden come back and just hammer it for the next month and then all of a sudden I got to work for it again right it's it, it just we can go and talk about addictive personalities and all other crazy stuff right and but at the end of the day, though, like I don't, there's nothing wrong with it. Like, go enjoy your fucking life. Like, if raging with your friends makes you happy, then go rage with your friends and and do that. If not drinking and and raging with your friends by smoking multiple bowls, like go do it, have fun. Like, or if that's not your thing at all, and you want to go and hike Mount Everest and you want to go do all those things, like go do it. Just live your life, right? And like without being judged about it. It's kind of what I I've gone to the point of like. I remember back in the day, and I'm pretty sure you too, when you first started coaching, was like, "You're oh, you're a weightlifter. You're not allowed to cross. You're not allowed to powerlift. You're not doing anything. You have to do this." Mm -hmm. It's it's no, like yeah. Well, and you know what? One of the interesting things. This is like kind of a broader topic, but it's like 
I, one thing I've realized in life in general is like, cause I've been interested in so many different things. Like I did strongman for a while, then I did CrossFit and now I'm into the endurance thing. And it's like, yeah, it, you know, on some level people are like, well, why can't you make up your mind? Or like you get, you get looked at as kind of weird cause you don't stay in one area, but it's like, dude, truthfully, like it's actually made me a much better human because I can speak yeah. to a whole bunch of different topics right now. I mean, obviously as a, as somebody that's on a radio show, it helps a ton cause I can talk to almost anybody. But then outside of that, like when it comes to programming methodologies, like there's a lot that I think that people should take from powerlifting and apply to CrossFit. And there's a lot that people should take from powerlifting and apply to endurance that it totally gets missed because people stay in their own swim lanes their entire life. Yeah. No, yeah, dude, that's 100% like true. Like, and I don't even want to go like elaborate on that because you hit that on the head. Like, it, it's true. We all know that. And that's just one of those things where it happens where people get one track and just it's, it is what it is. Yeah, you know? for sure. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, and that's like one of the things I like about Lionheart Radio. It's like we kind of jump all over the place and it's like somebody just yesterday was like, what is your show about? And I'm like, jeez, I, <laughs> I don't know. Man. But that's I, the fucking cool thing though, dude. Like, especially with this show, with this side show, right? That's what we're going to call it, the side talk or whatever else, like yeah, Lionheart side talk. Yeah, I think or whatever, so. Like, like, it's pretty much me and you coming on here and if we want to have other people jump on and it's just going to be a conversation of just... And, and you know what, dude? And, like, I think a lot of people enjoy that because of the fact, like, oh, yeah, these guys are talking real shit. Like, this is real life. Yeah, well, I think that's important, man. I think it's important that we talk about life as it pertains to training and not, like, just training all the time because nobody's fucking life is just training all the time. And if it is, your life kind of starts to suck after a while. Like, I've done that before <laughs> myself a shitload of times. Like, your life has to be more than that. And so, um, you know, like we talked about, like, we recorded an episode last week, which – probably isn't going to come out but uh in it we talked about like this need to balance your personal life with your training life right like you and I both kind of talked about these stories where we got so focused on a training goal that we let so many other things fall to the wayside that really just weren't that important in the long run and it took something like really gnarly like do you want to go back down that road I mean, we can if you want to. Yeah, dude, it yeah. was one of those things. Yeah, it, we were talking pretty much on how, like, when we were ambitious human beings, like sure. high performers, ambition, ambitious human beings who get one one side tracked, and if they have a goal in their mind, that is it, and that's the only goal. Everything else goes down to the wayside. And I kind of brought up this whole like people are talking about this holistic lifestyle, but then holistic really means like okay i'm just kind of focusing on a couple things here and there to kind of live my life the way i wanted to multifaceted and everything else like that and then i kind of look at it and i change it to the realm of this holographic approach and due to the fact of this holographic approach i'm now able to be like when i become one-sided i all of a sudden just focus on fitness and sleep nutrition family all my other priorities kind of go to the wayside right, right. and then all of a sudden this tragedy happens and then all of a sudden that fitness that you are that whatever goal you're working towards it now goes down because some tragedy happened you all of a sudden now have to shuffle shuffle priorities and be there and the, and the example I use and this was a real thing that happened was uh, a year that I was really competitive in CrossFit I decided to stop I decided pretty much my grandfather passed away so we put my grandmother in a nursing home back home and once that happened it kind of got into the season of all right off season preseason getting ready for for trying to qualify for regionals the following year. And it kind of went to the point to where throughout that whole year, I really didn't talk to much family, didn't talk to her, my grandmother at all. She would call a couple of times. I would talk to her maybe for five minutes, but nothing really serious. Didn't see her for a full year. I flew back home to see her because I got hurt actually um, in a workout of the open in that year. We ended up flying back home to visit her and surprise her. And four days later, I was burying my grandmother who I hadn't seen in a full year. And it, like we talked about in the last show, and like we started not going to post it, but we shouldn't be letting tragedy dictate like where our priorities are. We should be letting our happiness dictate where our priorities are um, in a realm of like, all right, what makes you truly happy, right? Like I know my priority is being the best father possible. Everything else underneath that are sub purposes or sub priorities to that. And you even said it your same. I mean, you, you had a similar story too you talked about, right? Like there was a tragedy that happened and you had to change it. I mean, you yeah, can go ahead and talk about that. Yeah, it was the same idea, but I think like the overarching theme, I, re I remember this from last week, I was talking about it a little bit, but it's like this idea that you have to, you can't let your ambition fucking drive the car all the time. Like you need yeah. to know, like ambition ha it should have a place in your life because without it, like what would we be doing, right? Like we'd be, you'd be garbage as a human if you didn't have some kind of ambition, if you didn't have a goal to orient yourself toward and work toward. 
but the problem is when you're a sled dog like you and I are like you know the thing about being a sled dog is you get really focused on the goal and the mission and you're really effective at doing that and then what ends up happening inevitably is like you know like you just talked about you get to a certain point in the goal setting process where all of a sudden you realize I guess it's something happens and then you take stock of what really matters and you realize that while ambition was driving you prioritized the inside four walls of a gym over family or over uh, friendships or relationships or, or whatever that looks like over school who even knows right but this is something I noticed when I used to sponsor a lot of CrossFitters um, I remember like a bunch of them because we had a lot of people that were like right on the cusp of getting there you know they were like just regional level kind of athletes, um, which is really hard to get to in CrossFit in, in today's CrossFit world. Yeah. But the thing is, it doesn't pay much, and you really have to sacrifice a lot. And I, I have nothing but respect for people that sacrifice like that. But sometimes I would see like people with families and people like really sacrificing for it, and I, I would just hurt for them because I'm like, I know how focused you are. I know how bad you want this. But when you go to regionals and you get 14th and there's nobody in the stands because you've blown off your fucking family all year, like, I just, I hurt for you. Like, that's a shitty place to be. And I think as athletes, it's something that we all have to, like, recognize in ourselves and try to figure out some way to curb because, man, if you just let your ambition drive all the time, like, you, you end up in a really shitty place. Well, and that's the thing where it comes down to now. And, like, I look at it this way is, like, it teach it now that's educating the athlete or educating that human being on how to compartmentalize their priorities for the day, right? Or for however else you want to think about. It. And we've talked about this last week also is when we compartmentalize the of, of the day is we look at the full day, right? And be like, all right, cool. I know I have to train twice today. I know I got to work today, but also my number one priority is my family or my kids or my girlfriend or calling my mom or whoever else or just doing something that's gonna go ahead and make you a better human by reaching out and talking to someone else, mm -hmm. right? Like Ryan Muncy talked about that today on his live story or his story on IG was he, we used him again. God damn it, that mother. <laughs> Love you, buddy. Um, he talked about this. He's like, say hello to anybody and you'd be surprised on what comes of it. Yeah. Well, and like, okay, and like that was one of those things where it's like, man, that's super cool to be able to understand that as like, okay, cool, I can be this ambitious person but it's okay to slow down and look elsewhere and ask and ask people how they're doing, how your family's doing, spend time with them for a little bit because it's going to make you feel that much better after you get back onto the computer to do work knowing that you were able to spend time with the family, do whatever else. And I think a lot of people miss that, especially now with the, the, the entrepreneur realm of people growing now, right? And I'm looking at fitness. Just everyone's trying to become an entrepreneur now and no one realizes like the struggle and the sacrifice to get there, yeah. right? Like. No one understands it at all. And like, it's one of those things where there's, it sucks. It's a fucking shitty road to go down. And a lot of people don't realize everyone thinks people just got there night and day when it, when it's, it's not. Yeah. Well, you know what? I mean, there's, it's definitely like the, uh, buzzword right now. Like entrepreneurship is a buzzword in our generation. And, uh, I think it's really cool because there's like a whole bunch of people blazing their own path, which I think is fucking yes. amazing. Yeah. Um, but as somebody that's like, kind of like balls deep in that path right now like i'm telling Same you here, turn yeah. back <laughs> turn back dude well, it's, i wouldn't it's... even i wouldn't even say turn like keep going like i i wouldn't say turn back like but look to the left and right of you also yeah because like if you look to the left and right of you those people that are going to be to the left and right of you are going to fucking take care of you down the road when you need it right like that's the problem do not put the horse blinders on and just continue going forward Put your head on a swivel and continue looking left and right and, and, and seeing who's actually around you and supporting you in that because at the end of the day, that's who's going to be there. And, and, and a lot of ambitious people who do that, you'll see their circle's very small. And then those who don't do that, their circle's really big. And that sounds very counterintuitive because of the fact of, okay, why – like, well, if I'm looking left and right, I feel like there'll be more people around. But no – no, you're looking left and right, or you're looking all the time with your head up while you're on this path. You get to control who comes into your life and who's going to help continue moving you forward. When you go ahead and move that path of being ambitious and have the blinders on, you now have no control of who's watching you and what you're doing, right? And now from there, all of a sudden, you have negative 
impact. You have positive impact. You have people who are just there to gossip. You have all those kinds of things. And again, this all comes from experiences from your end, my end, seeing other entrepreneurs who have gone really high and they kind of pulled themselves back because they don't want to be in the spotlight anymore. They want to enjoy what they're doing. So I, I think that kind of plays just to everyday living too. Yeah. Well, entrepreneurship, I think in a lot of ways is like, it's like trying to make the games. It's like some really big, ambitious, like athletic goal that you would set. Like you, it takes so much drive, and that's. I guess that's what I was getting at. Like when I when I think about how entrepreneurship is like, it's a buzzword, and it's kind of like looked at like being a rock star in today's light. What they're not understanding. It's the, really not that fucking cool. Yeah. Right. Well, they're not understanding all of the like struggle behind the scenes. I guess that's what I was getting at. Um, yeah. But yeah, man, I think like it's it's hard to balance because I was I was just thinking about this like this morning because I spend so much time on my friggin' computer because like not only are all my businesses on my computer, but I'm also like trying to be a writer, so I'm writing a new book. And it's like, man, I'm I'm not talking to humans right now. Like I'm literally staring at this screen and I miss talking to humans. Like luckily I still have the military, so I have that like camaraderie during the day and a lot of things that I do. But I take a shitload of time off to work on this stuff now because I'm getting out and that's like one of the things that I'm trying to figure out. Like how am I going to correct for this because I – like humans just need – I like me, I know I need human interaction, right? Yeah, and I, I guess that's one of those things where we you can look at it as – or even like same here, like I mean I work behind the computer all the time and the, inter the human interaction I do have with people is either through the computer text. Um, with people or text message. Yeah. Um, you know, I have, you know, I'm super lucky to have support that I can sit here and talk and, and have really good conversations and stuff like that. And, but the thing is, though, is like, it's, it's really hard to say that, man. That's unfortunate that the, that's where society is going, right? Is, is all virtual. Yeah. As a whole, like we are becoming, and but we're becoming very disconnected. It feels like because of it. Yeah. And we saw that whole, like the Dr. Andy Gap and Brian McKenzie and those guys put that book out unplugged and talked about it. Right. And like, it's made some awareness and people are starting to understand it. But I think what we're missing though, is the, the communication you have with somebody of having not just communication, but also having critical thinking skills. Cause I feel like if you don't have proper communication, you're not able to convey what you're thinking even if you're a con uh, a critical thinker and i learned that you know i've learned that with working for softly right like when i write emails yeah i have to write a proper i have the email that i have and i've gotten better at it right and all that good stuff but i've had to learn how to convey through email on a communication realm of my critical thinking instead of having it the old way of what it was mm -hmm. yeah what's go for it, i'm sorry no I, I just think what's interesting is like everybody is kind of becoming adept to new forms of communication. I mean, like I, I've probably had a whole bunch of conversations in the last week that didn't consist of that much more than emojis and like a couple words. And we basically knew what we were saying. Um, but I think like what, what's interesting is if you look at society as a whole, the fact that we're becoming more adept to technological conversations, you got to wonder like, how is that affecting us? Like, I mean, cause there's a lot of things that are rising, right? Suicide rate is yeah. rising like crazy. Depression rates are rising like crazy. And it's like, well, I don't know. I mean, is that part of it? Like probably I, I, well, I don't, I don't know. That's the thing, right? Like we, we had, we talked about this we talked on, we talked about when, when did we talked last week, right? We talked right after the podcast we did that we, but we talked about all the suicides that are happening, not just on the veteran realm, but happening in the celebrity realm. And all of a sudden now, like, the celebrity realm of suicide happening or hap that people are killing themselves, all of a sudden now people are trying to aware, promote and, and push awareness of suicide where suicide's been around forever, right? Right, yeah. Like we look at we look at a lot of people who have schizophrenia and, dep and depression, anxiety, and we have PTSD and all those things where this has been around for a while, guys. Like just because your favorite artist or your favorite cook or whoever else all of a sudden offs themselves, mm -hmm. you know, well, you know, what it like, oh my God, what did you do to help them? <laughs> yeah, and you know what's interesting is this is probably gonna be a super unpopular opinion, but like, all right, so we're just off the back of Anthony Bourdain killing himself, and that's that's kind of what, what we were referencing last week, but I look and all of these people post a meme that says like, if you know somebody that's going through trouble, reach out, and it's like, dude, all of you fucks are just trying to make yourself feel better by posting a meme 
when the reality is right now you have a friend that is struggling so bad you couldn't imagine, but you're so, your face is so fucking buried in your phone that you don't even understand it. And I know that's probably not a popular opinion, but it just like that seems to be the reality. It's like we're so disconnected. We make ourselves feel better when we post a meme or some bullshit. But at the end of the day, like there's real people in the world that are struggling right now. And it's like, I don't know, for some reason, it just seems like we're, we're growing more and more disconnected. And, and that's where it goes back to the lack of communication we're talking about, right? The lack of communication and the lack of critical thinking skills, I, I feel like pair very well together. And if, and we're missing that point on it, right? Like for Bourdain, right? Like if someone talked to him or he was able to talk to somebody, cause we don't know his lifestyle. We don't know what happened. And like, well, right. other good knows, stuff, I mean, who knows, but like, you know, people are like, well, we just saw him a week ago and he was perfectly fine. It's like, okay, cool. Was there like a legit conversation people were having to where they noticed different changes? Or did he start like did he have did he have tendencies to where people were like, Oh, that's just who he is because he's super famous, he wants to go and put himself away when like that's not that's not where it is. Like yeah. it's kind of one of those things, you know, when we look at it and right now you have you have we have a couple guys right now running across America right now, the Yeah, what Willow is Owens and uh, another guy, yeah. Yeah, and they're running to help you know, support and create awareness for suicide for yeah, veterans PTSD, yep. or PTSD and all the other good stuff. And like, that's super cool of them to be able to continue doing that. Right. But those people who have not talked about, like you said, just like you just talked about that are not talking about it or don't even care for it. But all of a sudden when someone they know, i.e. a famous actor or some celebrity passes away and kills themselves, all of a sudden now they're making themselves feel better by posting this because they're thinking it's going to happen. It, it doesn't make any sense, dude. I, I don't. I just don't get it. Yeah, I. I it's a. Uh, you know, I, I guess I should probably preface all this by saying like I'm not a psychologist, and so my opinion just is what it is. But I'm more just giving the opinion of someone who's like, you know, I've heard it really bad before. Like I've been hurting, and I'm telling you the people around me. Like I don't. I still say what's up. I still smile. So when people say like, oh, we saw him a week ago and he was fine, it's like, dude, I'm telling you he wasn't fine. It's just that. Nobody, you know, most people, they're going to give you the surface layer of interaction and then you're not going to ever dig deeper. And so, like, I think that speaks to the importance of having, like, human connections in your life. Like, it's it's one of the things I, I went to a Jordan Peterson talk uh, last week and I watched him give a lecture. And one of the things he talked about was this study where they had all these rats and they noticed uh, the rats who got, like, their bellies tickled when they were, like, gr when they were growing – were actually like more productive and healthier rats. And somebody else actually replicated this study at an orphanage. And yeah, and so all, they had a huge problem at the turn of the last century where like these orphan babies were literally dying and nobody could figure out why. And this girl read this rat study and I can't like cite it right now, but basically she went back to the orphanage and she started experimenting, having all these nurses for 15 minutes, three times a day come in and like basically rub these babies' bellies and tickle them and like sure than shit the the uh infant mortality rate just started dropping like crazy and it's because humans require human interaction like we literally are animals that require touch we require uh that human connection and so that's kind of what i was getting at when it's like okay if you look if we progress if we project this trend outward where does it lead i don't know that it leads anywhere that great <laughs> I, I really I, I don't know either um, and I'm not knowledgeable enough to speak on this whole you know the reason why it happens have I had have I had multiple buddies kill themselves yes have uh, have I had someone close to me and my family try to yes uh, have I had to save somebody from doing it yes um, it's just one of those topics where it, I just I can't answer the I can't answer that question I don't and I don't think anybody can except for the person who takes their life I, I really believe that. I really believe that they are the ones that only know the reason why. And everything else can be, uh, like, you know, speculation. Everything else can be, you know, well, he was on, you know, for Bourdain, they were saying, oh, what killed him was him smoking marijuana. <laughs> like, it, it, that wasn't it, right? right? But then all of a sudden there was something else popped out. It was like, oh, he was having financial problems. It's like, guys, like, just because he smoked weed and he had financial problems doesn't mean he went and killed himself. There was something deeper under a line that none of us know and only they know about it. Yeah, but you know what we don't recognize often enough in my opinion is that life is fucking hard. Like, yeah. you know, a lot of times like this is something that's been killing me. I don't know. It's like it's maybe a byproduct of our motivation culture and Instagram or whatever. And I feel like maybe I'm on my soapbox a little bit too much today, but it's like 
everybody like posts these motivational like just get after it just do it type motivational bullshit memes on instagram and shit and it's like dude we should talk about the fact that life is really fucking difficult and things don't work out all of the fucking time for people like literally like there are like there's tragedy and it's like i've started taking that approach to everybody i meet like i'm just assuming that they're going through some hurt that i it's so much harder than i could even imagine like some breakup something that's just like feels like their whole world is collapsing and we don't treat people like with that we we're just like we'll just fucking get out there and do it and it's like that's not reality man life sucks it's really fucking hard and if we had a little bit of compassion toward each other like maybe that conversation would be able to, would go a little bit differently I think a lot of people miss the mark on having empathy towards another human being. I feel like they don't get it towards them, so they don't rely it back. It's kind of shitty, right? And 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 for myself, I was in that realm too, where I didn't know how to provide or or how to have empathy towards somebody or something, mm-hmm. right? Even being a father with my daughters and all that stuff, like I only knew how to do it to them very very little due to the fact of where I was at my with my mental condition, like not mental condition. I don't like to say that because I don't have a mental condition for my mental health. Right. Um, and now it's a lot different, right? Because of the fact that we are now, I'm now able to, and people are able to have empathy and have compassion for one another. And, and, and it's just one of those things. Like I always, <laughs> what I say now is I prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I use that all the time now. That's what, that's just what I do. Right. I prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Why? Because, I'm setting myself up to know that, hey, there might be tragedy, but at the end of the day, though, there is still going to be happiness in some shape, way, or, or, or form, or way, however you want to look at it as, is kind of one of those things. Yeah, and, and you know, something I've started just realizing for me is like, man, the only thing you can accept is that life is going to change dramatically all, or dramatically all the time. Like, life is going to be in constant flux. Things that you thought were going to work out aren't going to work out. Other things that you had no idea are just going to come out of nowhere and work out and it's going to make the whole entire thing worth it. And it's like you kind of got to hold on to that mentality or at least that's what I figured out for me because you know this is something in the entrepreneurial realm. Like a shitload of projects you take on are not going to see the success that you want them to see. Um, and you just kind of got to – you got to figure out a way to shoulder those in some way and – it sucks like it it hurts it's going to be some of it's going to feel personal and like you just got to figure out some kind of philosophy or internal methodology to deal with all of it and so for me it's like just realizing that man shit changes and I have no I can't there's so many things that work out that I couldn't expect and vice versa that it's like I'm just going to put what I want into the world and other than that I'm like I'm holding on for the ride (laughs) you know what I mean it's I call it I call the it's a circle of life it is, right? Like you have one point in your life that you're going to go through a transition and then all of a sudden it's going to get better. All of a sudden we're going to go through another portion of it and depending on how you handle those stressors, those external stressors is going to be how you in- handle the internal stressors of what's going to be coming in that circle next. And all of a sudden it's just going to happen. I mean, how many times have you, how many transitions have you had in your life seriously? Like if I was to break them down, right? For myself, I've had a huge transition from um, you know, I've had one big transition from family divorce, right? From my parents' divorce and that was a transition for me. Right. And then having a transition into from high school into the military, that's a huge life changing (laughs) transition. Right. And then from the military to your civilian life after being in the military for however long you are in it, that's a major transition. And all of a sudden now you manage to get in, you're doing really well. Now, the next four or five years, you're trying to find security. All of a sudden, five or six years later down the road, you have now provided and found a security, which now prevents or adds into another huge transition in our life. Like yeah. these transitions in life just continue coming, and they're either going to have tragedy along with it, they're going to have positively, or they're just going to have a whole realm of different things in there. And we just have to accept it as how it is. And like I'm not perfect, and I'll tell you this: when that shit happens to me, it hits me hard, and I think it will hit me even harder now because of how much more emotional and how much more compassion and empathy I have towards life compared to the way it was before. Yeah. To bring the conversation like kind of full circle back to what I was talking about at the beginning, it's like my thought is how do you go through all of the things that you're talking about? Like this is all the life shit that people deal with, these huge transitions. And how do you go through those but then do you still ensure that you're moving from the bottom of the left part of the graph to the top right? You know, it's like how do you you ensure that even though your life is complete chaos and circles and just trying to make it work and transitions and, you know, huge victories and huge failures. Like how do you ensure that you're always moving toward 
progress. I mean, if I'm waking up every morning, I think I am, huh? <laughs> yeah, I guess. I, 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 I can't, like, literally, dude, I couldn't answer that question because of the fact, and it comes down to we all are wired differently, right? What might work for me might not work for you, and what might work for you might not work for me, or some of the things we're saying might not work for some of the listeners who's going to be listening to this, but then some of it might resonate with some of them on pieces of it. So, realistically, I, I couldn't answer that question because of the fact, I can tell you what helps me out, right? Like, you know, being able to know that the simple things now, right? Like, do I have money in my bank account to support my kids? Do I have enough to pay for, you know, when I say support my kids, child support and having a roof over my head, am I able to feed myself and feed them? All right, cool. If that is, if that being pro- produced at the lowest, lowest level of progress, then I'm happy. Right. Everything else on top of that is going to be extra. I guess you can say like where I come from that is is that's my progress. Yeah, yeah. For knowing that I'm moving somewhere every single day. Yeah. When I think for me it's um it's looking at how do you react to all of those different situations so that when you go into the next one you carry an attitude that like helps you transcend. So this is just the theory that I'm working on. It might be complete bullshit, but to transcend something, you have to uh, learn from what just happened, right? You have to take what was good, leave what was bad, what didn't serve you, the parts of you that didn't serve you, and then move into that next situation. And so I think on some level, it's like, like you just mentioned, like somehow throughout all those transitions, you didn't become closed off which is something that happens to people all the time. Like you go through breakups, that's something I just struggled with hard. It's like, how do I not become really closed off? And like, you know, you just wanna be like, fuck you to everybody because you're so mad or bitter or sad or whatever it is. But it's like, you can't, it's, then, you, then you're not progressing in my opinion. It's like, the way that you transcend is you look at that entire situation, whatever chaos, whatever shit storm just happened, you look at all the parts, look at what went, what went wrong, what didn't work for you, what didn't serve you, what did work, and then take those things that did work and then still be open to the next possibility in life. And I think for me, like that's the only way to progress. Well, and that, yeah, definitely, right? Learning from our experiences, no matter if they're a positive or a negative one, and from those two, from those two, from that experience, you and go ahead and take not letting them step. change you negatively. Yeah, and, and I think that's where we miss because we're getting real human. We're not perfect, and we're talking about this because I'm not going to lie. There was a stint in my period of in the military where I had to re-enlist in the military. I re-enlisted, came back from deployment. Then all of a sudden, I had five people who were super close to me come, you know, pass away, die within – every year for five years straight, right? And before that, I had a, I, was in, I was engaged, I was getting ready to get married, and that went down the shithole, right? So the, act, the, the, the action of those three or four years or five years, how you wanna think about it, of all that, then transcend me into having a four, about four years of close, being closed off, having no compassion towards somebody, and being this go-go type mentality of like pain is gain and I don't wanna feel anything to where I am today now, where I posted about this the other day, was this gentle warrior where I I feel compassion, I have empathy, and I learn from those mistakes, and I know that if that was to happen again to me, because it is life and we do have tragedy happen, I know now that it's not gonna go ahead and close me off, but it's gonna be okay. I've been through this in the previous years, I saw what happened to it after it happened, because we know with the action, there's a reaction. So. Going into that, I think that's where you can hit the head on that, man, is the, is the fact of, you know, we do see that happen. But now that you've kind of gone around the circle multiple times or through transitions multiple times, you now know how to make it easier to go through that transition. And again, every transition is not going to be easy. But you can manage the stress of those transitions a little bit better than the previous time you going through something like you talked about. So that when you do transcend, you transcend into that aspect of look who I am today. Right, right, and you take all the best parts and like, but you have to fight for it. Like, I mean, oh yeah, when people are dying around you, like what what you just mentioned, like, yeah, I mean, dude, yeah, you have to you have to fight to not let that change you in a very negative way, and 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 it's hard. It is hard, and the way that life is is like you are doing one thing at one second, and then the very next moment, a piece of information comes to the surface. Somebody cheated on you. Somebody died. Somebody is leaving. Somebody it doesn't matter somebody's in the hospital like that is the way that life is like it can be a it's a moment and then your entire fucking life is different and you have to you have to fight super hard to not let that change you in the worst way Uh, but I think if you can man I 
there is a way it does get better, right? It always gets better. And if, I think if you can take what you learn from that experience, apply it to whatever comes next, that's the only way to make sure you're moving in the right direction. Yeah. And, and, and I think I'm going to use an ex- I have a, I have a, it's funny we're talking about this now, dude, because this is a perfect, perfect sh- show of progress for me as a human being with compassion, having, uh, being, having empathy. Um, again, like we talked about having like, my dad passed away when deployment came back and then, um, my step grandmother passed away after I came back from deployment. Um, a couple of buddies passed away in that deployment, um, from other units. And then I had, uh, my best friend pass away and I had my grandpa and then I had my grandmother, right. All back to back. And every single time I got a call from home was because of the fact of someone, some kind of tragedy happened. So for four years, dude, and, and I did, like for four years, because it just hit me this, just this week. Cause I realized that, but for four years, I was afraid to answer phone calls from home. For four years, I was afraid to answer phone calls from home because, one, every time someone called me from home, some kind of tragedy happened. It was and, bad. And it, and it was it scarred me, right? Like you want to talk having PT, like I was I had I had tra- trauma from that five years of all that happened because I like, well, funny thing is, my best friend, um, really close with his parents, like we grew up and everything else. Like, like I'm the second, like I call his his mom, my mom also. Hadn't talked to her, haven't heard from her in about a year because we usually talk on his birthday. Well, I didn't hear from her this year, but she called me again just this week. And I was like, I didn't answer it at first. I was busy doing something, but I listened to the voicemail right away instead of like leaving it alone. And it was because they're coming out here for vacation next week and they wanted to see me and link up and everything else like that. And I was like, that's awesome. Like, but it shows right there that I had the like I was like okay from the past however many years ago that happened to where I was okay to be able to open the phone and being like oh it's Mama Diane like what's going on Mom like how are you doing right and like making sure everything's good and like she's like all she wanted to let me know was she was coming out here to California to come see me or not come see me but coming out here for family and she wanted me to come meet up with them and see them right and like that's an example of showing progress because the old me would have not called back or wouldn't have answered or listened to the voicemail. Yeah. Because it would have, because I was afraid of what was going to be on the other line. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, that's it. That's it. Exactly. Right. Like, so if you're asking like the trans, like transcending, I've transcended into something different, into something better to having compassion, have empathy towards something and understanding that. So you're on that, you, you know, on the head, man, wherever you're going with that theory, it does work. And, And it's, Again, theory, you know, science and theory is all just an opinion, right? Pretty much is it's just it's just a proven p- opinion. Um, so I think you can gather enough research behind that dude to go ahead and give you some some solid, solid arguments on it. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, I'm just fighting it out somewhere in the middle, you know. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna start doing this show like weekly, essentially, and we'll we'll put them out like at the beginning of the week. But uh, the Lionheart kicker is obviously the question that I ask at the end of all of the normal Lionheart radio episodes. Um, but I said for this show, like where I'm going to make up a new question throughout the conversation, and then I'm gonna we're going to ask it at the very end, and that's going to be the kicker for this, and it's going to be completely different. Uh, kind of like that one show, Whose Line Is It Anyway, where the points don't matter and we make up the winner at the end. It's like that. <laughs> <laughs> so today's Lionheart kicker is, when do you feel the most alive? Oh man, that's awesome, dude. Because that's that goes back now to our like having compassion towards something or someone and having empathy, right? And that goes to I'm gonna I'm gonna say this, dude. Like it's everything. When I'm going through a low, when I'm going through a high, when I get to go out and run for two hours and come back and spend the next evening in time with my kid, right? Or being able to be behind the computer and producing programs and helping humans become better, like all that has helped me make myself feel alive. Right. Even in the darkest times, I've now accepted it and knowing that, hey, I'm alive. I get to fucking handle this. I yeah. get to go ahead and put my head down. And now, hey, now when, um, you know, the, that ambition human being that we are and that high performer who we are, hey, when shit gets shitty, I can now put the blinders on for a little bit and work through it. But guess what? When I come out of it, I just felt something that I don't get to feel all the time. So now I can, now I'm able to experience both sides of the spectrum and be able to know that like hey like i'm grat like i have grat i have gratitude towards being on the low end and the high end so wherever i am at i'm living life to the fullest is kind of what i've gone to so that is my opinion that's that's just what it is man like and people can say like oh there's no way you're you're living life every fucking day like i have a roof over my head i'm breathing and i'm waking up and i get to see my kids like 
and get to do what I love for a living, yes, I, I'm living life to the fullest. Right. Well, and it sounds like for you, it's like a, it's like a constant reminder too. Like you're constantly telling yourself, like, "Fuck yeah, I get to do this," and that's yeah. huge, right? It's just, it's just like, and so that's another big thing we talk about validation, right? And and affirmation, right? Like I'm just giving myself validation that what I'm doing is making me happy and it's my passion. I get to love it, right? I don't need anyone else around me to tell me that I'm doing that because I know deep down inside that I am doing it. And, right. and, and it's one of those things, man. And I think once you can find that and be okay with that, then you will be living life the way you want it to. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. That's cool. How about you, dude? Ah, oh, man. Um, you know, I, I thought about this a lot. I think for me, like, I feel the most alive in the extremes. Like, I, when... Uh, and, and it's funny because I think in life we fucking tend to avoid the extremes and, you know, it's something that's become more popular as of late because of biohacking. But this idea of like cold water submersion, like that was something I realized like when I was like 15, it was like when I – and growing up in Maine, the ocean, the warmest it would get is like 60 degrees. So when I would go out in the spring and the water was like 45 and me and a bunch of friends would jump in the ocean, like that's when I felt alive, like – all of like you're just your hoof sees like every cell is like reacting to this like you know your body's trying to stay in homeostasis so like your body's just buzzing with vitality as it's trying to like fend off all of these different stimulus that are coming from the outside so for me yeah i think um i think that's why i gravitate toward the extreme so much like these moments when it's 1 a.m and i've been running for 12 hours but you just crest perfectly where it's like a full moon and the stars are out and it's like for some reason like when i find myself in those extremes, that's, I think that's when I feel the most alive. And for that reason, I tend not to avoid them. I tend to look for them in life. People you like, actually chase them. Right. Cause people are like, Oh, are you a masochist? I'm like, no man, I'm just looking for that extreme, that, that moment where everything hurts or everything is hard. Everything's uncomfortable. But for a second, like I know unequivocally in this moment, I'm fully alive. But the cool thing about that though, right. And this goes now to where, when you are not in that position at, no, at, when you're not running for 12 hours, 1 a.m. in the middle of the night, and it's hurting, you are now with your buddies, having a beer, enjoying a sunset. You now can be like, have that same exact feeling because you've endured the other side of that. Yeah, because then you appreciate the rest of it. Exactly, right? And I think a lot of people miss that, though. 100%. Yeah, dude, it's crazy. But And that's another thing, too, right? Is like, it's funny you say that, is like, um, going back to none of us, none of us are perfect. And like, we go through our negative spots and I have them, I have them quite a bit than people will think I would have them. Um, but I found ways to like control, like found ways to get rid of them and actually cold water submersion is one of them. I will like, if I'm feeling like I'm having a really shitty day or if I'm having a really negative headspace and you know, it, I just need something different than a run or I need something different than whatever else, like I, I, I want to feel that, I will go in and put three bags of ice inside an ice, an ice tub and I will go sit in there for as long as I can and I will fight through it and I'll fight through it to get to a certain place and then once I feel that I've been in that place a certain for long enough, I go ahead and get myself out of it and then do it. Why? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we're able to control it. Yeah. Well, it's a re it is a really good reset button. Uh, Ryan Muncy talks about that a lot, like resetting your physiology. I think that's that's what it is. Yeah, dude. And and I think what happens is is I think with us reaching the extremes, because I get told this all the time, every time you come back from a long run or do whatever else, um, you're a different person. And it's because we, we reset our psyche, right? Like going through a 33 mile run or a 50 mile run or a 100K or a 100 mile race, like you go through something and it resets your, your psyche to come back on the other end of like, holy shit, that was crazy. Yeah, And right. we're, starting to, we're starting to see this nowadays, man. I start seeing it a lot. You know, we'll talk about a lot of guys nowadays are, are looking for that, are looking for that extreme. And I think it's really fucking cool, dude. Like I was watching uh, Red Bull TV the other day or yesterday evening. like, And dude, do you have guys now when they're used to boulder V15s and whatever else, like two, three feet off the floor? Dudes are now climbing highliners. And like they call it high balling bouldering where they're climbing V15s for like 30, 40 feet off the ground. No ropes, nothing, just crash pads. And dudes are chasing it and they're, they'll talk about it. They're like – they're talking about it and they're saying like when I get to a certain height on that, on, that, on that climb, everything just goes quiet around me. And it just goes fucking just quiet. I don't even realize where I'm at and it's just – I'm in this pain because I'm trying to hold on to this. I'm trying to hold on to this rock where I know if I let go, I could possibly die. Like, 
it's the same extreme talking about when you're on a mountain with 100 miles in or 200 like like 80 miles in on top of this mountain at 2 a.m in the morning and you have to go still another 20 miles and your legs are hurting you want to fall asleep you're sleeping and running at the same time you go into this state of survival mode that a lot of people do not experience anymore and all of a sudden now when you get back from it you're just like whoa that was awesome yeah, and I think on some level too, like what what it sounds like some of these dudes are going through is like they've reached that flow state, you know. Yeah. And that that's another time where I I truly feel alive. It's like when you reach that flow state. I I listen to a psychologist describe it really well, and I probably can't do it as well. But a flow state happens when there's enough of you anchored in what you know, but then there's a part of you that's reaching out into chaos and exploring a frontier that you've never explored before. And that's like what's happening with them, right? Like they're, when they're climbing, like climbing is something they know and understand, but there comes a point where the route gets so hard and it gets so high where you're like, you have to kind of reach into a frontier of the unknown and just hope that that hold is there. And that happens, you know, that happens with surfing, it happens with biking. Oh. It's that I think is what makes life worth it, honestly. No, it's, you you hit that on the head on the head, dude. That was spot on. That is the unknown, right? Like I'm gonna go ahead and continue walking forward to this unknown, and whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm preparing for the worst and hoping for the best out of this. I like right? it. Right? Like that's exactly what it is, dude. That's what I kind of look at is now, right? Is like that's legit, dude. Like you said, you nailed it on the head, man. Um, that was fucking perfect because it goes into everything you think about. A lot of people are comfortable not not going into the unknown, and they're okay with their life, but doing tapping into the unknown you know once in a while for people i think um would make society a better fucking place yeah completely agree <laughs> all right we'll end it there george thanks for joining me tonight thanks buddy thanks for having a late night coffee talk with you <laughs> <laughs> thanks guys thanks for listening to lionheart radio i hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter happier and healthier for the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or would like to suggest a guest, send me an email at rick at louaviv.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E. Dot com. Thanks for your support, yeah. and we will see you next time. Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest nigga be the coldest. Cleveland.